Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In today's special episode, we sat down with Bruce Jones, senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and author of To Rule the Waves, How Control of the World's Oceans Shapes the Fate of Superpowers. He sheds light on how in history naval power translated over to world power, how that's playing out now between the U.S. and China, and how the cold reaches of the Arctic are becoming the next geopolitical flashpoint. Let's dive in. Bruce, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. And so I want to begin with your book, actually. You wrote one recently called To Rule the Waves, How Control of the World's Ocean Shapes the Fate of the Superpowers. So tell us about that. What does naval power have to do with really like world power? Well, it's very striking when you look back at the history of empires in the modern period. And what you see is that for most of the last several hundred years, the state or empire or nation that was able to uh, most successfully dominate world affairs was the state or nation or empire that had the largest and most effective navy in the world. Um, for a brief period, that was the Portuguese. Uh, for a long period, it was the British. Over the last hundred years or so, it's been the United States. And it matters because so much of world trade uh, moves by the oceans. So much of how we live our lives is shaped by commerce across and uh, underneath the oceans. Um, just think about digital communications, which is central to everything we do now, modern finance, modern social media, everything else. 93% of all data in the world moves on undersea cables. About 85% of world trade moves by ocean-going container ship and bulk carrier. So if you can dominate uh, the world's oceans, it really gives you an extraordinary influence on global affairs. Um, the United States has had that for the last 100 years or so, uh, the British before. Uh, and now, of course, China is competing to gain those advantages. It's built up an extraordinarily important role in uh, ocean-going commerce and trade, uh, but it's also now building uh, its navy faster than any country has done since the United States did it during, after Pearl Harbor, uh, a huge expansion of Chinese naval power and the beginnings of a uh, a network of bases and et cetera that would give it global reach. So this is, I, I think, central to the dynamics of competition between the United States and China in the contemporary period. And Bruce, so speaking of that kind of sea presence and naval power, it seems right now, especially in headlines a lot, is the South China Sea, right? I think you mentioned in your book, too, there's a lot of attention there, but less attention is on the colder water, say the Atlantic. And a big part is the Arctic. And it's interesting because it shows up in the beginning of the book and then like again at the end. So why is the Arctic so important? It seems there's more than just polar bears there. Why are all these world powers looking at it? Yeah, it's become, I think, one of the hottest zones of competition there is. Uh, the, the biggest issue is that climate change is rapidly changing the ability to sail across the Arctic Sea uh, year-round. Now, it isn't quite there yet. It's still the case that you can only transit the, the Arctic waters, unless you have a, a huge icebreaker, but you can only transit those waters about four to five months a year, some months, six months a year. Uh, but that's changing, and within a foreseeable future in 15 years, it's going to be possible to transit those waters year-round. Now, if you think about it from a trade perspective, the difference, the distance between Shanghai and New York, if you can sail the Arctic route, is about half the distance if you have to go through the Suez Canal, across the Mediterranean, and then across the, the Atlantic Ocean. So it has the potential to dramatically uh, cut trade times um, with dramatic uh, savings. It was similar in, in nature to what the Suez Canal did to trade between Asia and Europe when it was first uh, established. So it has the potential to be a major uh, change in global commercial routes. That's one. That's two, uh, with warming waters, it's more easy to access the energy reserves that are underneath the, the, the Arctic Sea on the continental shelf off the coast of Russia, which are huge. Uh, the largest gas find in the world recently was in those in those waters, in Russian uh, waters in the Arctic Sea and the Barents Sea. Uh, so there are huge commercial stakes. There are huge energy stakes, there are huge fishing stakes, um, and of course there are strategic stakes. This is where Russia now has the largest concentration of its naval power 
Uh, the United States has begun to return nuclear submarines to the Arctic for the first time since the end of the Cold War. Uh, China is deploying repeated scientific missions, which are, you know, frequently dual use. Um, and so this is really becoming a zone of uh, tense uh, military buildup. And Bruce, I want to get to the strategic part, but going from the commercial side, in 2018, China announced their plans for a Polar Silk Road, basically a network of Arctic shipping routes. So how would that change kind of the geopolitics of the region if that were to succeed? Yeah, well, this is, and it can't happen yet. You know, China is laying the groundwork for it now. It's, it's, as I said, a decade or so down the road when the waters will be ice free year round. Um, but it would dramatically shorten trade times and allow China to further consolidate its already overwhelmingly large presence in global uh, commerce. Uh, just to give your listeners one measure, one indication, you know, the largest port in the United States now is Los Angeles, Long Beach. We've all seen of late uh, sort of pictures of container ships stacked up trying to get in, etc. Uh, LA Long Beach processes about 9 million container drops a year. That's moving those large containers on and off, those huge container ships. Uh, Shanghai does 42 million a year. And the four largest ports in the world after Shanghai are all Chinese. So it just gives you a flavor of how large China looms in global commercial trade uh, and ocean-based shipping, which is you know everything we produce and everything we consume ends up in that system at one point or another. So they just play a huge role, and they're looking to continue that, looking to continue their their dominance in ocean-based commerce and the polar trade route. If they can succeed in establishing it, uh, will will do that for them. And staying in that vein, it seems you mentioned in the book that uh, Russia has quite a big presence in the Arctic. They also send a lot of gas to China through that. But Russia has been militarizing the seas. So how has Russia been doing that? It seems on land you would see soldiers stationed. But how do you militarize the ocean? Well, uh, through the naval presence in its northern bases, and it has uh, an important base in Murmansk in the north, uh, opening up onto the uh, opening up onto the uh, Arctic Sea. It's been building up its so-called northern fleet. Russia has five fleets historically. The northern fleet is now one of the larger ones. It's been moving resources up into those into that base. It's been patrolling and exercising out across the Arctic Sea, the Norwegian Sea, and down into the North Atlantic. It's declared large swaths of those waters, including waters that are actually in Norwegian territory, to be sort of part of its self-defense zone. That's, that's pretty controversial, pretty provocative. Um, it sails nuclear submarines in and out of those waters into the North Atlantic. It's the closest route, obviously, to you know, if you want, if you're Russia and you want to put a nuclear submarine off the coast of the United States, it comes down through uh, the Arctic waters, through the what's called the Giuk Pass, which is the Greenland, Iceland, UK pass. It's a channel of water that separates those those countries. Uh, so for for Russia, it's a very important route to the North Atlantic and to threaten the United States. And on that note, so it seems China's benefiting from this gas that Russian supplies them, but China doesn't seem to like this militarization of the seas. As you mentioned in the book, there's a lot of commercial aspects if this Arctic route opens up. So I'm curious, though, would that only benefit China shipping or if the U.S. were also to commercialize that area, would that benefit us? How does that work? Yeah, it's this funny thing about modern commerce, right? Because, of course, like, you know, as has been true for the last 30 or 40 years, uh, global trade is such that when we are growing, so are the Chinese and vice versa. It's, uh, um, you know, the expansion of that trade route would be very beneficial for us, would be very beneficial for them, would be beneficial for the Europeans. Um, so there is this sort of dual logic at play. At the one hand, we're militarizing the Arctic, and the Chinese are, are militarizing too. They don't have the same reach that the Chinese, that the Russians do but they're certainly interested in the military and strategic dimensions of the Arctic. Um, uh, and at the same time, we're developing it commercially and, and, and we operate the same way. Look, we're, we devote huge amounts of our resources to protecting the flow of commerce in the Western Pacific, the primary beneficiary of which is China, which is now our largest rival. And so this is very odd dual kind of contradictory logic between the trade global trade regime that we all work in and the mounting geopolitical tensions and naval tensions that are the, the reality of our time. And part of the point I'm trying to make in the book is that we are we are underestimating the scale of contradiction between the geopolitical world that is emerging 
on the one hand, and the continuing realities of globalization and global issues that, that don't go away just because we have a new geopolitical uh, competition. We're still trade dependent on the Chinese, they're still financially dependent on us, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those realities don't change just because we now have these geopolitical tensions. And I worry that we are underestimating the contradiction between those and not adequately preparing for the costs and consequence of what I think is likely to be uh, increasing militarized competition and potentially clashes between ourselves and the Chinese, especially in the Western Pacific, but also potentially the Arctic. That was Bruce Jones, senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and author of To Rule the Waves, How Control of the World's Oceans Shapes the Fate of the Superpowers. And for those watching our full episode, after a break, we hear more from him on how the U.S., Russia, and China are eyeing the Arctic, how the tensions there reflect into the wider world, and what steps need to be taken now to counter rising trends. Our full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you soon.